All right, everyone. Again, welcome and thank you for joining us today. We'll, uh, we'll kick this off uh, just to do the same time here, and we'll just admit everyone here um, when, as they come in. Uh, so again, my name is John Zavala with Next Stop Veterans. Um, again, we're here, our organization is here to provide uh, veterans with employment resources such as resume writing, um, interview skills, preparation, networking, connections, again, just mentoring them uh, through their employment search, okay? And today we're gonna to discuss um, interview uh, skills and communications. Uh, so before we begin, I'm gonna go over a couple things. First is the housekeeping rules. So today, again, just if you're not speaking, I'd ask you guys to, to remain on silent. Um, and just, if you have something to say, obviously unmute, uh, ask the question and please um, mute it back. Um, Today's in the spirit of this communication, I guess, talk or uh, um, subject, we're gonna ask that you kind of go away from the chat room unless you would like to share your LinkedIn profile, maybe your email address or maybe some resources. Uh, please use the uh, chat room and share and discuss some resources you have. Um, but other than that, or unless your device doesn't allow you to speak, again, use that chat room. But I'm gonna ask the attendees, whether you're here, as a veteran um, going through the job search or, or transition, or whether you're here uh, supporting a panelist or maybe another organization, I'd ask you to please, one, jump in, give some advice, uh, uh, you know, get the conversation going. Um, and then with that, introduce yourself for the first time when you do speak. Um, that way you can let us know who you are, maybe your branch of service, what you did in the military, uh, what you're doing now, what your skills are. And if you are, again, looking for employment, uh, what type of industry or uh, uh, job you're looking for. Uh, again, that's gonna help you just with your elevator pitch, uh, get you a little more comfortable. Uh, this is a networking event, so I encourage you guys to, to talk amongst each other, um, whether it be exchanging account, LinkedIn profiles, and just put yourself out there and get to know one another. All right. All right, so before I get, I, I introduce the, uh, the panelists today, I'm gonna kind of go over uh, what this is all about, um, the background, and I'll recap uh, last month's um, workshop that we, that we did. So again, this, this workshop is, is intended more of a mentorship, all right, so a, a, a more of a veteran transitioning service members, a, 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 play, a safe place where we all can get together and discuss uh, maybe their, their um, the ups and downs of their transition and employment search, right? So. Um, kind of the purpose of me putting this together was again, I'm fresh off my retirement, um, but six months ago I retired. Um, so it's, I still have, I guess, the hangover of going through my transition. Uh, I was lucky enough to sign up with Next Stop. I took advantage of other of their resources, their workshops and other resources out there in Houston area. So I attended some of the, again, the in-person workshops. So they were, there were great opportunities, awesome workshops to attend, great info. Uh, but I always, what I always say, what I took out of it was getting to know the attendees and just talking about all our personal issues with our transition or our, our um, employment search. So really at the end of the day, um, it, I left with the confidence knowing that one, I wasn't alone. Uh, two, I, I know this sounds terrible, but I had, I had other people that were going through the same, I guess, misery as I was going through, um, whether it be you know, not getting the call back for a job, getting the no thank you, um, talk, going through an interview, but, but not meeting the criteria or again, not getting the, getting the job offer. So going through the frustrations, um, thinking I was the only one going through frustrations, uh, but talking to, going through the workshops, I realized that I wasn't the only one having a hard time articulating my military skills. I, I, I wasn't the only one having a hard time, again, getting rid of that, that military jargon and speaking civilian terms. So uh, when I got, was lucky enough to come here at Next Stop, uh, I just, we just sat, sat back and decided, hey, what, what can we do, especially with the pandemic, everything shut down, how can we go ahead and still impact veterans and help them out um, with us, again, being quarantined or being at home. So we came up with this idea of doing a monthly uh, panel workshop where we had various uh, professionals come in, give some advice on different subjects, and with the hopes of just hoping uh, it's gonna impact somebody, uh, whether it be now listening in, or we will record this, post it on social media, and maybe someone uh, sometime later going through the struggles, transition, 
they can they can listen to this and it's going to help them out and maybe alleviate them going through the struggles i had um, so again I, that's the purpose so last month we had the conversation on ats so the applicant tracking system so it was, it was an awesome time we um again it was an open forum uh, we had some recruiters and some uh, hr reps on the line uh, just kind of giving actual insights of the do's and don'ts of when you apply put your resume out there and then how it scans with different companies everyone's different um, with their ats system you know what's how to stand out uh, what different companies utilize as an ats system so just it was a great event again i recorded it we'll go ahead and, and put that on the on the uh, chat room if you guys want to check it out um so one second please i apologize All right, I apologize, I'm back. All right, so with that being said, I would like to, I'm gonna introduce the, the, the panelists here today and I'll kind of go, I'll kick off and uh, I guess intro the communication and um, interview session. So today we have the pleasure of having Ann Binion. She is a supply chain management um, professional in, in BP. Um, we have Rich Goodrich. He's a talent development manager from Workforce Solutions. Uh, we have Armando Perez. He's an HR um, VP, uh, VP here at, at Perry Homes. Uh, we have Sarah Smith, a recruiter with Enterprise. Uh, also today we have Craig. Uh, I want to give, uh, I guess, a shout out and mention to him. He's also with Texas Workforce Solutions, uh, but he was instrumental in putting this together. Um, we did, again, we talked about it before we started. This is our fourth session. Uh, so without him, without helping us out here, uh, we wouldn't have this. Um, so he is definitely part of the process of building this, putting this together, and then making it is making what it is today. Uh, so I want to thank him, thank uh, Kevin Rout, who wasn't able to to join. Um, but also, I would like to uh, just introduce here uh, our our next stop team. Uh, we have Patrick McManus, uh, we have Chris Cabanis that just logged in here, uh, Dina Anderson, um, Tiffany Bradbury. Again, they're all uh, with Next Stop, and we're, they're all they have a passion of helping veterans out. Um, in our community. So again, I want to mention them and thank them for, for putting this together. All right, so I'm going to give my spiel. Again, I'm going to, I'll leave it. I'm going to open it up to the panel to, to kick it off. But I have two things I would like to talk about. Um, I'm going to kind of go on my soapbox, if you will. Uh, so disclaimer, I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm not the one that has great communication skills. Um, I, I, I bomb on interviews myself. So this is really more of me telling, talking to you and letting you know that how I messed up, what I messed up. Um, that way, hopefully, maybe this can kind of help you out um, in the future. Um, so just kind of kicking it off with my transition, right? So I would like to say that I worked to the last day of my, to my leave, terminal leave started with my transition. Um, I tried my best. Obviously, I still try to help out as far as doing my transition, interviews, preparation, all that good stuff. But I will tell you, honestly, I, I sat there till the day I left, um, involved with, with my section, with my Marines, uh, getting the mission completed, um, again, to, to the last day. So I'm proud of that. Um, I, I say that because I was doing that my transition while in the, in the office, right, in uniform. So I would be in my, my I guess, Marine mode with, with my Marine hat on, uh, doing what I do every day um, with the functions at, at my unit. And I would get a phone call from, let's say, a potential um, employer or a recruiter, whatnot. Whatever I apply to, I would get a phone call from them, um, and I would have to quickly learn to kind of remove that aspect of the military side, run to my office, and close the door, and kind of take that hat away quickly within seconds, and move into my civilian mode. So that was difficult for me. I, I but yeah, I'm not really a personal person. I'm not really a communicative person. And it's going to be very hard for me to, to sell myself or to, I guess, connect with that person on the other line. So I did have a, I did have a struggle. Um, I got a lot of no callbacks as far as that initial phone call. So my personal uh, story was I got, maybe because I'm more of the HR field and recruiter field. So I got a lot of phone calls from straight from the HR department, our recruiter and they would call me. I'm not sure how it was for everybody else, but I got that initial phone call from them 
<laughs> hindsight, I think it was because to screen me out, to see who I am, what type of person I was before they went further. So I didn't get a lot of interviews. I got that initial phone call, right? So again, I didn't get interviews from there. A lot of them, they didn't call me back. And obviously I realized hindsight where I did not articulate. I wasn't, I didn't come, come off uh, personable. Um, I didn't connect with that person on the line for various reasons we'll kind of go over um, that warranted not getting a phone call back or not getting that formal interview. So again, that's one of the reasons why I thought this was very important to, to talk about was that communication um, just to kind of help you as an employment searcher, I guess, if you will, how to communicate, what to expect, uh, what the verbal cues are, um, just to get you that phone call back or the interview. Um, so again, that was my kind of struggle, which we'll kind of expound on a little more. Um, and then now fast forward six months later, I've been here at Next Stop as employment coordinator, and I'm kind of paying it forward, and I'm talking to veterans each and every day with their employment search. So I'm seeing their struggles. And again, I, now I can go on my soapbox and now I can be on the other side and now I can go down and point to them and say, hey, do this, don't do that. Um, this is what you should do and whatnot. So the, one of the main important thing I wanna talk about and why I put communication was the importance of understanding that every person you speak to during your, during your transition or your employment search, you have to treat it as if it's a potential job opportunity. All right, so that's where I kind of had to convey to people. So that's where a high percentage of the veterans I had talked to, they don't take it serious when, we're, when I'm speaking to them. Again, I hate to put myself on a high pedestal, I'm nobody, but it's just, you'll be surprised how when we coordinate phone calls as far as um, appointments, where we say, hey, when you're out, thank you for signing up for Vet for Next Stop. This is what we do, this is our services. We're gonna help you out with your employment search, your transition. When are you available? They'll give us a mutual time we can, we can meet uh, on the phone, um, that they, we both agree, and I'll call them. I would assume they have no idea who I am, right? They don't know what I can provide. They don't know if I have a job or not. They're not sure. They just know that we're an employment service. And you'll be surprised how unprepared, and I would say unprofessional, some of the veterans are. And I say this to hopefully um, just convey this uh, because it's very important because you never know who's on the line that could potentially help you with your um, transition or your employment search. So I, I, with that being said, I, I tell you that I've had various encounters with different people as far as, again, they knew that we had an appointment, right? But they're out there at a store. They're eating lunch, dinner, what have you. Um, they're at, at the bank. Uh, they have a TV loud in the background where it's very distracting. Um, they might come across very um, impersonable or, or lack of, uh, of, of connections and just kind of very dry. I'm, I'm a very dry person. So Dina, I would probably imagine, again, I signed up and I was the other side recipient of the transitioning service member. And I will probably tell you, she probably left a phone call with me like saying, this guy is like dry and boring. And who is this? Because I was very like, yes, no, thank you. Bye, whatever. Like I wasn't really involved. Again, that was my fault so that, that I went through. Um, so my point of me, this big old spiel is, it's very important to, to get connected and be personal with that person. Because again, that old saying is, the more, I guess, the, the sweeter you are, the nicer you are, it's gonna go a long way for that person to help you out, right? If, if you're very st straight to the point, I don't wanna say rude, but if you're very disconnected, I leave kind of a bad taste in, in our mouths as far as after the conversation. Am I going to want to work with this person you know, every day for the next how many times, you know, however long? Um, am I going to really help this person or go the extra mile to help this person out? Is he, this person willing to put in the work as I am to his transition, to, to their transition? So, I mean, hopefully this helps. But again, just, just being, putting yourself out there, having that connection, uh, being personable those kind of cues go a long way that will allow people to help you out. Maybe that job offer will come out because you make that connection. Um, so again, we, we all help each other out, but there is personal, personally differences between a very um, a combative or maybe a, a too cocky person where we're like, ah, oh, this guy is full of himself. I'm not really gonna help him out too much versus someone that's personable 
willing to, will, willing to take advice, willing to hear some resources, um, I'm going to be able to take the extra mile. So I think to me, it's the same thing goes, goes the same way as an employer talking to somebody. If they have that connection, I will kind of guarantee they're going to be more, more willing to interview them, help them out, you know, give them some advice maybe. Um, so all those things will go a long way and to assist you with your employment search. Um, so again, I know that's a, a, a drawn out long spiel. Um, so I hope it kind of made sense. I hope it kind of resonated a little bit. Um, but with that, I'm going to segue to the panelists. Um, I'll kind of lead off one is that long spiel. Um, you know, Craig, can you, do you want to elaborate a little more or, or what you think about my story? You know, there's a, a lot of real, real, and it's your truth. And it's one of those things that is, is everyone's truth at some point, as far as uh, looking at the military versus talking and taking off that hat. Because um, a, a lot of times that is something that we always have to struggle with because we want to throw acronyms out there. We want to be aggressive, not aggressive. In our minds, it's not aggressive. We're just trying to be direct or we're, this is my professional face, but you know, it's important to know, and, and it's really good to hear, you know, a good, honest perspective, John, because it, it is something that's different. And I had a friend of mine that just retired, probably like it was this month. And it's true, when you put on that civilian hat, um, we shouldn't ever lose the military part of us, but we do have to recognize how it can build on what we're doing, navigating this transition, because, um, we do need help and that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, but we do need help making sure that we can navigate that and understand that, you know, if I say, I need to make sure this is done, it's, I gotta put that hand down. You know, I have to, you know, be able to know how I'm being received. And that's why communication is so very important. Um, when you talked about um, people not realizing the background and, and who they're talking to, and it kind of goes back to networking because every opportunity where you meet someone and talk to someone is an opportunity where that could branch out. It may not be something successful right then, but then that's why you got to keep trying and, and to speak from just my short version of my experience. You know, I retired a couple, a couple of years ago, but I have to also come to terms with the fact that every time I speak to someone, every time I'm in front of a lot of people like here, it's an opportunity to make sure that, you know, every impact, everything you say is impactful because it is important. And who knows when the thing you say is going to be like, yeah, I, I, I didn't think that meant anything. And now here it is three months later going, well, what, okay, th let me go ask that person again. So networking is very important. Communication is very important. Um, pitch, elevator pitch, like you mentioned, is very important. And I think the only, the last thing I would say is that's the best thing that you can work on. We can talk about interview questions and what to ask at the interview and what to wear and all that kind of stuff. But if you can't speak on yourself, that's the first thing you should approach. How can I talk about myself in a short amount of time? I've got 30 seconds to two minutes to say something so that when that person turns off their camera, turns off, hangs up the phone or doesn't look at me again, they remember I need to reach out to that person again. Or what's that person's number? Because the elevator pitch is so very important because it lets that other person know your why, your story, why they should care about talking to you again. That's my two cents. Um, and I would like to just ask you anything to, uh, to add as well, um, as far as you remember for your initial transition. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I wish we had something like this uh, back in 2002 when, when I got out of the Marines. I, I was kind of going through a, a, a double whammy actually because I got out in January of 2002 and I avoided stop loss. It was right after, close after 9-11 and they were anyone that had an, an EAS, an end of active duty date of separation um, in January was uh, supposed to fall under that. Luckily, because I was accepted to school, um, I was able to uh, to go right back to go right back into civilian world and uh, and go into uh, into college. Um, I will say the transition was very difficult because I was leaving Japan, um, so um, that that was a big transition. Um, obviously, transitioning out of the Marines into uh, civilian life was was um, very difficult. I had a lot of anxiety 
Um, and I went to a smaller school, which was good because it did help a lot. Um, but people kind of looked at me strange when I talked. I still used a lot of jargon. Um, it was uh, it was difficult. Um, but um, you know, unfortunately, um, when I got school out of the way and decided to um, to start pursuing career, um, I, I I knew a lot of people who were former vet, who were veterans, and and that really helped um, because uh, they were able to help me kind of transition into uh, into civilian world. Um, I, I will say that I went through a lot of disappointments too, as well. Um, I went through a lot of interviews, a lot of, you know, thank you, but you know, we're not, um, you know, you're just not the right person we're looking for at the moment. It's, it's discouraging. Um, but, you know, I, I think um, the, the, the biggest thing I had um, was just to, to, just to keep going and, uh, and know that there, out somewhere out there, there was a career for me. And it took a lot of time um, to, to, to really find it. I did an internship with the uh, United Space Alliance um, shortly before I graduated uh, down at Kennedy Space Center. And I thought to myself, when I graduate, I'm definitely gonna get a job with them. And it took me six months. And it took literally uh, sending out interview, uh, uh, resumes and cold calling uh, and um, you know, constantly uh, going to job fairs. Um, I think Monster at the time had just come out. Um, so that was the only big career board at the time. And um, you know, finally I was able to, you know, to get a job with the company and kind of work my way through to where I'm at today. Um, and at one point I had to take a job as a temp organizing a, a small company in Texas City, organizing their filing cabinets <laughs> just, to, just to have money. Um, but I took all the little odd jobs I could just, just to get by because I knew at the end of that there would be a career for me. Um, so I, I guess my advice from going through what I did is, is just, um, just to continue to pound the pavement, connect, uh, network, um, also, too, one thing I, um, I did was everyone who helped me, I always made sure that they were in the loop from start to finish. When I had that interview, I would go back to them and let them know how it went. If I got the job, I would let them know when my start date was. I always wanted those who helped me get to my career, feel included in my, in my journey and, and my success uh, down the road. And that's, I think that's one tip I would give someone is if someone goes out of your way, their way to help you, whether it be interviewing skills, or I had someone reach out to me uh, to help a veteran who was interviewing with BP and they wanted to know more about the company and the culture and what kind of questions. And I was happy to sit down and, and, and give them as much advice as, as I could. And I told her, you know, once you're done with the interview, let me know how it went. I never got that. It was very disappointing because not only did I give her time out of my schedule to um, advise, but also I, I wanted to celebrate if there was a successful ending. I, I wanted to continue to keep her in the loop with me. So if there's something else at BP, I can help her, I can guide her, I can uh, give her advice of, of how the company is. Uh, so I, I would definitely encourage those, uh, someone helps you, make sure you keep them connected, keep them in the loop from start to finish, because not only is it a courtesy, but also you can continue to help them if, if they do lose their job or if they want to find something else, you can continue to be their guide. Awesome point. So you just, you just called me out, Dan. So I did not do that to, to my <laughs> mentors. <laughs> So I had two mentors with my transition and they really helped me out as far as um, dissecting and translating my military you know, HR skills that we do um, mm -hmm. and then translating it to the civilian side. Because again, I had no idea what the civilian, I, I was scared as far as all right, I'm confident in what I do here, but does that translate to the civilian side? I had no idea if it, if it matched or how it would work. But those, mm -hmm. those two people I was able to talk to, we sat down over the phone and, and communicated and said, all right, what do you do daily? I told them. And they said, all right, this is what we do. This is what it's called in the civilian side. It's called onboarding, or it's called this, it's called that. Um, so I was able to translate my resume uh, with the help of Dina, and we were able mm -hmm. to fix it up. And that way I can articulate all civilian terms 
of what I what I did. So that really helped me out. So he called me out. I did not I did not thank them in the end as far as they're helping me out. So I'll definitely have had to uh, reach out to them. Um, it's just a tip. <laughs> good advice. I'm gonna go ahead and and go to my first question, and I wanna uh, point it towards Armando and Sarah. So this is gonna be in your I guess perspective, your point of view, um, some insights. When you make that initial phone call, uh, what are you looking for in a candidate? Um, what are their verbal cues, you know, maybe nonverbal cues, um, you know, what makes them stand out or maybe disqualify them from not getting a, a phone call back? Um, just kind of don't show your code things, just kind of tell us straight to the point as far as what, what can we do to mess up and do good as far as that initial phone call. And Armando, you can go first. Morning, everyone. Um, the uh, so I, I guess I'll give you two perspectives. Uh, and, and just so everyone knows, uh, I'm not a veteran. Uh, thank you to everyone for y'all service. Uh, but I'm kind of bringing an employer perspective. I have about 20 years of HR, with a lot of that being on the recruiting side. But um, so if it's a first call that we're reaching out to someone, kind of the expectation is different. So my recommendation to you is if you're out there, you're looking for work, if you've submitted resumes, treat every call you receive as it that's the employer calling. Because uh, if you answer it and you think I'm a spam call and you don't have your professional voice on, it's going to get off to a rocky start. Uh, or if it sounds like you're asleep or something like that, or if it goes to your voicemail and you have an unprofessional voicemail or music playing on your voicemail, uh, it's not what we're looking for. Um, so, and then when you get on that phone screen, uh, what I tell people doesn't have to be elaborate. If you're applying to jobs, it's good to keep a list of what jobs you're applying to. Just a simple list and what the position is. The reason is you're not just applying to Perry Homes, but when Perry Homes calls you, I want you to make us feel special. I want you to apply to the construction manager position um, and why you're interested in it. And if you know a little bit about our company, and I know that's asking a lot because, you know, realistic, you might be applying to 20 different jobs. But if what I get out of you is Perry Homes, who are you? Uh, what job are you talking about? At that point, I mean, it, you're going to have to really turn it around 360 for that call to just end successfully. Um, so that's kind of it, if it's a first call. Simple list, know where you've applied, and just expect a, a professional call anytime you get a call. Uh, and trust me, I get a lot of spam calls. Uh, point two is if we've already had one of those and then you're expecting an interview call, John, I think you hit on some great points. You know what time it is. We're usually going to give you at least a day notice have yourself don't be in a loud environment don't be driving uh set it for a time that you're able to take time for it i rec dressing professionally you know even if it's a zoom call or whatever and you're wearing shorts but i see a shirt and a tie you know that's off to a good start it's going to separate you from the people that didn't dress professionally at perry we're conservative i got to wear a tie so for our industry that works well um, and then just be prepared. You know, if it's an interview, if you made it past that initial phone screen, you know, I'm going to expect that, you know, a little company history, um, that you're ready to make some small talk. Uh, and you can even prep for that small talk, try to make it come off natural. Um, and then just answer the questions, you know, as honestly as possible in regards to, John, I know you brought up jargon and things like that. If you're talking to someone that hasn't been in the military, of course, def definitely recommend translate whatever you did in the military to how it translates in the civilian. It's gonna, we'll be able to understand your skills and how they translate over. And then the last piece I would say is be really professional. Don't get too comfortable in that environment. I'll just give you an example. If someone says one curse word in an interview or a phone screen with us, that's it, you're done. Doesn't matter what the rest of the interview looks like. And the reason we do that is if you feel comfortable enough to curse in an interview with us, then what are you gonna do when you're in a homeowner's home, you know, for a warranty call like that. So that's just a, a little bit of advice uh, in regards to that question. Okay, great. Thank you, Armando. Awesome tips. Uh, Sarah, please, your insights. So you guys, my name is Sarah. I uh, work with Enterprise Holdings. So my professional history is based in HR as well as sales and management. Um, I would say, you know, I think Armando had some great input. I agree with everything that he said. I, we look for those things as well. 
Um, starting with that initial phone screen, I would say that the biggest thing that I look for is confidence in talking about yourself. So kind of like what John said earlier, you should be an expert on your professional history, um, whether that comes from working with an organization to translate that military history into the civilian jargon, but you should feel confident talking about yourself. That's the biggest thing I think that you can convey over a phone screen that will get you to an interview. And something you can do to help with that that I always found was that it helped me to stand up. If someone calls me, I know we're about to begin a phone screen, I always stand up because that body language really is going to translate over the phone. Um, if you do make it to the face-to-face -face interview, a lot of those are held virtually now like this. Um, if you're someone who kind of like John said earlier, you have a difficult time conveying that warmth it might be beneficial to record yourself and see how you come across in a webcam setting, be able to watch that body language, how you speak um, in order to help yourself going forward. And then I also wanted to agree with Armando's point on professionalism in the interview setting. Uh, our company, we are also very conservative in an interview setting. We're very conservative as a company, all of our employees wear tie, uh, ties, it is business professional. And so that's something that I'm looking for when I go into an interview. Are you going to be equipped to go into that environment? I would also kind of going in with what I said about the phone screen, you want to be in the right state of mind for that professionalism. And so I would suggest if you're going to do a virtual interview that you are dressed professionally from head to toe. Um, even if you're going to sit down the whole time and you have your slacks on, you have your dress shoes on, because it's really going to put you in the right frame of mind to conduct yourself in an appropriate way. Um, I also agree if there's any kind of inappropriate language, even slang or inappropriate stories, I'm really not going to consider that candidate any further because that tells me that if you can't conduct yourself in an interview professionally, I really don't want you talking to our customers or our clients going forward. Um, I do also want to say I, I am not military. I am purely from an employer perspective, a management perspective. I want to thank all of you for your service um, and what you've done for our country is truly invaluable. And I look forward to building relationships with all of you. I left my LinkedIn in the chat, so feel free to add me. I'm happy to look over resumes and to do any kind of one-on-one -on -one sessions as well. Awesome. Thank you. So we talked about that rapport, uh, you know, building that, getting that warmth, like you said, Sarah. Just I would like to see if you guys gave us some tips, you know, Rich, if you want to chime in, please. Uh, building that rapport, you know, how does that work? What can I say to build that rapport? Is it simple words of how's the weather? Like, can you give us some good examples of how, how to build that personal ability or, or, or rapport, like I said, and what does it look like? Sure, thanks, John, and thanks for inviting me again uh, to the panel. Um, I want to go back to what Armando originally said, some small talk that you can make by just doing some research on the company, in his case, Perry Holmes, and it starts off with that. So I think if you do some research, that kind of aligns with the small talk and building rapport as you go forward. I've heard uh, great stories of perseverance and the veterans that are uh, on the call willing to be uncomfortable, uh, willing to uh, learn something new and get away from all the acronyms. And I think that's a key part of it also. Um, so building rapport starts with uh, making the interviewer and their team feel comfortable about their own company. Uh, if you do the research and if I'm interviewing with Armando and I'm talking about Perry Homes and the cities that they're established in, it uh, ties me in right away. You have to adjust to the interviewer and the interview team, not they don't need to adjust to you and what you did in the Marine Corps, the Army, Navy, or the Air Force. So that's a key part of it. And from then, uh, you can just kind of roll into the interview questions there. So uh, understanding the company and what they're about is a critical part of it. And that even starts with the phone screen. So I, I think uh, when you talk about billing rapport, um, they have to get to like you. And I think they'll like you if you understand your company. So uh, that, that's what I have to say about that. All right, awesome, thank you. So I'm, I have uh, this other question is broken up in three different, I guess, sub questions. Um, so I'm gonna do one at a time. So I think this is uh, a small, quick question. That's kind of gonna get a, a sense of everybody's feelings on this. This is where I struggled in addressing 
the potential employer as far as, again, me, I'm used to sir, ma'am, or, you know, rank structure or some type of thing. I had to get rid of that quickly and learn how to do the first name basis. Like, uh, you know, how do you guys prefer the uh, addressing each other or, or a, a, an applicant addressing you? Are you okay with them saying ma'am or sir, or is it more professional to say first name or Mr. Mrs.? You know, how, how does how does that? And feel free to again chime in. I, I think a little bit of both. Um... You know, I grew up in Texas my whole life, so I say sir and ma'am quite a bit. But if that's all you say, then it, it makes it a little impersonal. So, I, you know, I think use it some uh, to stay professional, but use their name because then there you build rapport. You know, when I meet someone for the first time, I on purpose use their name a few times because it just helps me remember it. So I think by using, uh, you know, their name. Uh, and you'll see when they introduce themselves, kind of what their preference is. You know, some people, if they're super high up, will say, you know, I'm Mr. Smith. But if, you know, I introduce myself as Armando, if that's the way I introduce myself, I would hope that someone would call me that. And uh, I just, it helps build that rapport uh, as well. Okay, good. Thank you. Any other different comments or any, any different thoughts out there? All right. So the next question to that is uh, just give us maybe some examples that someone was maybe too professional um, or maybe too confident and how that how that was perceived during a interview process or, or a initial talk. I think sometimes if you're going out of your way to be too professional, it's cold and rigid. Um, a lot of the times, especially if I'm hiring for like a sales position, I don't want somebody who's going to give me these short, very specific answers. I want someone who's going to draw me into a story. They're going to be personable. They're going to essentially sell me on themselves throughout the interview. And so I think that's one of the few times that over professionalism can work against you is if you do come off as cold and rigid and really not building that relationship with the interviewer. Okay. All right, anybody else? You have, is Anne, Anne, you wanna speak on that by chance? Maybe too, too cocky or too professional? Um, I, don't, I haven't really experienced that from an interview perspective, but I, I have noticed sometimes when I've been at veteran events um, and, and you know they find out, you know, VP's in the room and um, they come over to me and it, it's um, it, sometimes it comes across as kind of a what's in it for me type of type of uh, mentality, um, you know, like, oh, well, I served in the military. Why aren't you hiring me? I, I've actually had a few of those um, conversations and you should always treat every prospective co um, contact connection as someone who could potentially lead you to your next job. So always come always approach someone if you are at a veterans event or something along those lines uh, and you want to work for that company don't come across as what's in it for me instead come across more as a, i'd like to learn more about your company um, i think i'm a good fit uh, is there any advice that you can give me i can't just say okay i can go directly to a recruiter at bp because we can't really do that anymore we have a platform of how we bring in people that want to work there However, I can, if, if I know the hiring manager, I can possibly say something. Um, it's all about how you come across in that initial meeting. Uh, cockiness, what's in it for me, um, I deserve this. Those, those are complete turnoffs and it won't get you anywhere. And, and I think just to kind of caveat that, and I completely agree. And I think one of the things too for me, was coming out of the military, I had a lot of people that said that I sounded too serious. And sure, my hair was maybe a little bit shorter or, or what have you, but, um, or came off, and, I, and I'm gonna say this clearly, but boring. My voice was too, because I was Marine Corps, Marine Corps this and everything else. So um, to be someone to, to, be con to, to make good connections, to make sure that you're presentable, like you say, or someone that you wanna be remembered, you have to make sure that you know, in the military, all services, we, we are very monotone 
and we don't express ourselves with our hands because you're supposed to put your hands down, you know, but emphasize what you're doing when you speak, especially like I think Sarah said earlier, smile or stand up because that makes that emotion come across because everything we're doing lately is via virtual. It's on a camera. So how can you change that up? Well, the biggest thing about virtual interviews is that you control what they see. You really do. You control the angle, you control how far away it is, whether they can see you from the chest up instead of like right up against the camera. Um, it's important to know that when you're gonna use a device or a phone, you know, that, that phone against your face is gonna make you look huge. But part of that presentation is making sure that they can see you and that they can hear that emotion by making sure that you're presentable and that you're not monotone. You know, even if you've done all the research, you're gonna sound boring. So making sure that you can capture their attention in that short amount of time is really important and making sure that you translate that military part because we have a lot of passion, we have a lot of energy, but channel that aggressiveness into being something that they remember and making sure that you go from elevator pitch to answering questions in a good story so they can remember and connect it with the research that you put together and, and asking good impactful questions because you set a good tone, you set the tone, you set the, the environment behind you, you set the tone with the questions you may ask or the questions you may answer. And, and it's really important to know that, especially nowadays with the pandemic and all these other things, you can control a lot of things. So it may be unnerving and, and everything's challenging, but don't let that be what sets the tone in your interview. You know, oh, you know, with the way things are going, I'm really excited to be in this interview. You don't sound that way. Cause, so set the good tone. Be someone that, they, that you can connect with. I, I completely agree. Awesome, thank you. So this, this next question here, this is for everybody, the panelists uh, here at Next Stop. Um, if you guys can all take turns and answer this question. So I think it's important because I guess, I, I think we all do uh, assessments, right? After we maybe do an interview or maybe do something, we always self-assess and kind of rehearse in our mind of how we think it went or how it went. Uh, the good and bads and how we could do better next time so i wanted to see if you guys can give me your story whether you're the interviewee interviewer um, just give me a one a good example of a good interview you can leave names out but just give me an example of how a good interview went um, again whether you were a candidate or you're the, on the other side um, give us an example of how that person or you stood out and got that job maybe or or were the top candidate for it and how how a bad interview went. So again, each, each person here, just, just take, a, take a moment, uh, take your turn, speak on that, because I, I would guarantee that's gonna help someone out in the future, and then maybe give them that tip as you speak um, to help them out with their interview. So Sarah, you're, you're the first one on my, on my video screen. Please share with us a good and bad interview. Okay, so we'll, we'll start with the bad first so we can end on a good note, on a positive note. Um, so I did an interview, um, this is obviously, well, let's go, we'll, we'll do a COVID interview. Um, so a virtual interview via Zoom, the candidate was not dressed professionally. They were wearing a t-shirt. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is a very conservative environment. I do want you dressed professionally. I, even in my emails, when I'm setting up the interview, I remind you to dress professionally because it is an entry level. And so I like to try to help my candidate out. Um, so even with the email reminder, not dressed professionally, uh, extremely disengaged while we were on the Zoom call. Um, I could, he was noticeably looking at a different monitor, typing messages, extremely distracted during the interview. Um, there was background noise. Other people were in the apartment or the home or wherever he was. It was very loud. Um, it was a very short interview. It did not go very well. But overall, you could tell that there was really no interest in the position. Um, you could tell that it really was not a long-term plan to do with our company. Maybe he just needed something right now because of how COVID is. Um, he had previously been laid off. And you know, we can tell if you're just looking for something for the right now, uh, especially when it's that obvious. So I would say that was a pretty healthy list of don'ts for an interview. Um, an interview that went really well, we actually hired this candidate. He was dressed very professionally, head to toe in a suit. 
um, something that really stood out to me was that he actually had a ring light. So he actually messed with the lighting to make sure that the lighting was good in the Zoom call. And so I thought that was really impressive, especially because sometimes depending on where you are in your house, your apartment, your face might be in a shadow. It might be kind of difficult to see your expressions. And that is something that is gonna really help you if you can make sure your lighting was good. So I really appreciated the fact that he prepared to that level for the interview. Um, he was knowledgeable about the company. He was knowledgeable about not only the history of the company, but the position. He had actually gone into one of our enterprise branches to talk to current employees. And so the culmination of those things, the professionalism throughout, the attention to detail and the lighting for the interview, as well as going out of his way to talk to people who were in the position he was applying for, all really stood out to me as uh, best practices for an interview. All right, awesome, thank you. So it, it does go a long way with the presentation, preparing, um, so awesome, great tips. Uh, Armando, you're next here on the queue, please. Yeah, I think uh, those are all really great points, uh, and I think we're going to have a lot of similarities. You know, I'll, I'll start with the bad first, so we can end uh, on good as well. And you know, uh, just people that uh, you know, and I'll kind of stick with the COVID theme because that's what people are doing now is uh, virtual interviews, and we'll see how long that goes. But the um, be prepared, know what your background looks like. You know, we've seen some where like the background in the room, it's a real messy room. Um, you know, where uh, we had one where they weren't dressed appropriately for the interview. We also try to set them up with that. And they're just disengaged, uh, you know, uh, the phone's way on their face. Uh, they're, you know, I had one where, you know, I don't know why they couldn't adjust it, you know, but uh, it was like showing their eyes most of the time and then it would drop to their chin. And, you know, I, I know the virtual thing is, is different, but I, I think it is a good point. Practice it, you know, look at, if you're using a laptop, you're going to look differently than when you're using your phone camera. So know which one you're using, know which one looks better. Um, but I would say that those are examples of bad ones that we've had recently. Uh, background noise, I know that's a lot harder to control nowadays, but you still want to try to do it. And, you know, when I'm preparing for one of these, you know, I let my family know, I lock the door, you know, so just prepare for it. Uh, good ones, um, you know, uh, really it's going to be the opposite of that. You know, we hired a construction manager in San Antonio and he was prepared. He knew the company history, you know. Uh, he told me some stories about the company. He had visited some communities and he really related his job without me asking, hey, you know, this is what I did and I think it will translate well to the construction manager position because, you know, I led groups of eight you know, I did a lot of scheduling, uh, you know, I oversaw, I was in charge of quality control, and I think that will, you know, translate well into your job. Uh, came across confident, and then remember, it, it doesn't end with the interview, you know, after that, uh, I recommend a follow-up email, uh, that's always good, and then, you know, when we reach out to you afterwards, just timely response. If we ask you for some paperwork, get it back to us quick. Uh, if someone takes a few days to get it back, you know, how are they going to really be a good employee if it takes three days to get something back? So uh, those those would be some tips of uh, kind of uh, one that went bad and one that went good. Awesome. All right. So we're, we're talking about, I guess, the, the new normal, as everyone says, um, as far as interviews virtually. So again, you're just, you're saying the camera view presentation, it's almost as equal as the firm handshake, the eye, the eye contact, you know, all, all the, the cues that you normally would do with face to face. Right. Now it's translated to the, um, I guess, virtually or video, correct? All right. Next one is Tiffany. Please give us some a tip, good or bad. All right. So um, mine is from a, an applicant perspective, of course, because I haven't been in employer's shoes. Um, but I had a break in service um, back when I was in my early 20s. And um, when I separated from the Air Force at that time, the only positions that I had ever applied for or interviewed for were um, hourly, you know, retail type positions, those types of things. And so when I separated from the Air Force, even though we had gone through a transition assistance class and done all of that, um, I really didn't take all of that to heart because I was like, I had this confidence about my ability to interview that was a little bit, um, 
it was not substantiated because I hadn't interviewed for the types of positions that I was looking for at this point in my life. And I thought I was going to go in with the same type of attitude, the same type of, you know, preparation that I did for the retail jobs. And I was going to get the same outcome. Well, that was not the case. I didn't research salaries. I didn't um, do my research on the companies all of that. And because of that, I was unemployed for about six months before I finally landed a job. Um, so I didn't necessarily get feedback from those employers, but I did. I went in with, you know, expecting too much money, not knowing a lot about the company itself, um, and not being able to really translate what I could bring to the table um, for those positions. Other than, hey, I, I was, you know, four years supply in, in logistics in the Air Force. Why aren't you hiring? I mean, I had that kind of I guess, attitude about it. Um, but fast forward, um, came back onto active duty and did the rest of my time in the Air Force and retired after 20 years. And of course, I'm a little bit smarter now. Um, so I, I did my networking. I'm in this position because of networking. And I did all of my research on the organization first, um, thought about what types of things I could bring to the table that would be applicable in this position and um, had a realistic idea of what the salary would be, those types of things. And I think that was, you know, definitely the preparation was key. And, you know, going through conversations like we're having today, I think is, is the way to get around yourself, to get out of your own way is to take other people's advice. And um, so it ended up well in this case, you know, 20 years ago, not so much. So definitely preparation is key and communicating and listening to those that have you know, that experience. And that is my story. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so Dina, you, were, you have something you want to say real quick? Yeah. So please forgive me. My internet um, is a little spotty in case I do get bumped off. I got bumped off earlier, but Tiffany just brought up a really good point about networking. And I know we're talking about communication and interviews and things like that, but when you're networking, you want to make sure you're professional in your communication as well. Um, I see a lot of times, you know, veterans will reach out and it is it like Anne brought it up too. It's that what can you do for me mentality. So when you're reaching out to potential employers, whether it be on LinkedIn or if we're in person and you're attending a career fair or, or a job fair, something like that, you always want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're ready and you're professional and you're coming across with that positive attitude. Um, you know, don't reach out to somebody on LinkedIn and in your communication, just say, you know, hey, I'm a veteran and I'm transitioning. What types of jobs do you have? Or what do you have available for me? You know, Armando brought it up too. do your research on the company. Um, do that, you know, break the, the, I would say with the rapport, make sure you're reaching out and you're, you know, you're building that rapport before you ask for something. You want to be intentional with your communication. And it's not always about, like, obviously we know you're in the situation to where you want a job, but you don't want to come across that way. So just be really mindful, you know, when you are networking with employers um, or different companies or people that you're, you know, giving, you're doing an ask for that you're, you know, intentional with your communication. Because it's, it's so important that you don't come across um, in a negative light because it's, people are not going to go out of their way to help you. If you're just, you know, asking like, hey, what can you do for me? You want to make sure that you're uh, portraying yourself in a professional manner, you know, do your elevator pitch, let them know what your experience is and build that relationship first. Awesome. Good tips. I'll move on real quick to Craig. Do you have any the good and bads with your experience? Um, you know, good and bad, it's a, it's a crazy balance because when it comes down to interviewing, I mean, it, it, it depends on what happens. But I think um, just to throw a tip in there to help with the good, um, I'm not sure who mentioned it earlier, but feedback is something we never get, you know, enough of, right? We, we do interviews or we, we receive interviews and we sit in front of people. But one thing sometimes we always forget, especially in the military, is we don't give good feedback, counseling. And so one thing I would say is, in addition to the research portion, please make sure you're not afraid to ask questions at the end of the interview. A lot of times when we're advising um, managers and hiring managers on what to do and how to prepare themselves when they do interviews, a lot of times we say, hey, don't forget to include that portion about asking questions because that'll let you know just how interested they are. Because that's those are times where it's like, now the ball's back in your court, what are you gonna do? 
And the one question I always emphasize to job seekers is ask that question of, you know, what, did it, what is it about my position um, or my interview or my resume that most makes you question whether I'm a good fit? And a lot of people are like, why would I ask that? And I'm like, well, because you don't get feedback. So here's your opportunity to ask them, what is it about my resume or my interview right now that makes you question if my, whether I should get the position? And I've had people say, well, what, but, but what does that mean? I'm like, well, what it means is they can look at you right now and go, oh, everything's good. I think you're going to be awesome. Maybe they won't hire you. Maybe they will. But at least it's a good way to find out where their tone is, the interviewer. And then you ask them and they sit there and go, well, you know, we did ask for you to include if you were uh, bilingual and it doesn't see anything. I don't see anything in here. And then you can respond to that. You can change the tone of the interview, but it's an opportunity for you to find feedback, find ways when you're in that interview to get the response that gives them something to remember you by. And sometimes those questions can help you feel excited. You know, um, what's the most important or what's the best thing you like about the job? You're not, you're asking that to the interviewer. And imagine if you left a job that felt toxic or you don't like working with people. And then you ask the interviewer, what's the best thing you like about the job? And they go, you know, I, I you know, one of the things I like about this place is that we have lunch together. We go off to different things. And I, I've met one of my best friends here and, you know, our, our families hang out. And then you're like, this is the kind of place I want to be. And then you're excited again. So it breaks up that tone in the interview to just go, tell me something that challenged you in the job. Well, one time I applied a program that completely um, upended the way that we did the work and I got lots of kudos because change it up, be able to be personable. And sometimes asking questions is hard for interviewees or candidates because they don't know what to ask, but there's ways that you can really make an impact to them because you're asking good questions. What's the uh, day-to-day -day responsibilities look like? You're thinking you know what this job is like, and then you ask the interviewer and they say, well, there's going to be days where you might have to work on Saturdays or Sundays. And um, just the other day, we asked Mary to come in at 11 because we couldn't finish the project on time. And you're sitting there thinking, maybe this job isn't for me. And that's okay. But those are the kind of questions that can make you look like you care about this job because you should look like you care about the job. So um, good and bad because, you know, you want to be able to set the tone. Good and bad because there's ways that you can try to really make an impact to that interviewer. Awesome, thank you. So we are cutting time short here. Uh, so unfortunately, we'll not be able to get to everybody with their good and bad uh, points. So I will open up the floor. Um, attendees, anybody, if you have any questions you have, uh, now is the time to definitely chime in or maybe some advice that, that uh, you wanna kind of jump on. Uh, please, I'll open the floor up to everybody here. I'll uh, give for a couple minutes. Hey John, I just have um, two little tidbits of, of recommendation or knowledge that I just want to pass on from my experience. Um, when I interviewed for BP, I knew I was interviewing for a major oil and gas company, and you have to think about things that set yourself apart from the other 200 applicants or whoever out there they're interviewing. And, and one thing I learned is, is um, if they throw something at you, kind of think outside the box. So for example, I got asked like, um, what motivates you? And I answered, I said, you know, teamwork, people that are really interested in what they're doing, a good um, camaraderie. And they said, well, what, what demotivates you? And I thought to myself, they're gonna hear the same answer from everybody. So I gotta think creatively. And I said, well, nobody wants an Eeyore on their team. I remember Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, you know, the glass half empty kind of mentality. And I found out later after talking to uh, the people that interviewed me, that's how I got the job. That one little question out there that they asked me and I thought outside the box. And I'm not saying it works every time, but be a bit creative sometimes with some of the questions because it, it might just work out for you. And that's a really good point. Hi, I didn't introduce myself earlier. Uh, my name is Bobby and um, I'm, Craig was talking about me earlier. I just retired, actually my retirement date's at the end of the month. I'm on terminal leave right now. Uh, I just finally landed a job at Texas A&M University. So I'm super excited about that. I've been here about a month now. And of all the interviews that I did, which I did several, 
I think that the most valuable question that I asked was very, very strategic. Toward the end of the interview, of course, when they ask if you have questions, I said uh, something, you know, depending on the dynamic between me and the interviewer, I would, of course, uh, it wasn't scripted. I, I would just go with the flow, but it's something along the lines of what do you, what does success look like? What think a year from now and I was what would I have had to have accomplished for you to think for you to say that wow that was a really good hire you're the right person for the job this is multi-hatted because number one it lets them know you're forward thinking number two it forces them psychologically to visualize you not only in that position but successful in that position and then number three it's the it's the answers to the test what does success look like? They're going to tell you exactly what their expectation is from you, you know, in a broad general sense, I suspect, but it has been uh, that, that question has really, really helped uh, shape my interview skills because each employer, you'll start seeing themes as you, as you ask that toward the end and it will help you uh, increase your interview. At least it did for me or in, it increase the effectiveness of how well I interview. Great, Bobby, thank you very much. Congrats on your retirement. You already have your build, your beard already uh, grown out. That's good. Finally past the itchy stage. <laughs> awesome. All right, anybody else? Again, any thoughts, final thoughts, advice, questions? All right, so as we close off, I would recommend again, uh, check the chat room before we close it. There's a lot of uh, LinkedIn profiles, a lot of advice as well on here. So definitely scroll through, uh, connect with people out here. Uh, so highly encourage that. Um, just want to thank the panelists today. I really appreciate it. So again, this, this goes a long way. You can't imagine. Again, we all talk about how we kind of missed and we didn't have certain things when we we're going through transitions. Um, and just having this little small thing like this actually goes a long way and it definitely will impact somebody out there. Uh, so you definitely uh, are making a huge impact. Like I said, you're making a huge difference. So we definitely want to expand this, continue forward each month, make this grow. So definitely please let everyone know your, your connections that we're, we start in this group. I'll advertise this. We'll have different topics. Uh, please let me know some feedback. Um, anything that was going to help us out, help us grow this mentorship and this, again, this connection group that we have going on. Um, so again, I, I'm, this is an imperfect group. I'm, I'm not the one that normally would you would pick to lead a, uh, I guess, a podcast or interview type setting. I'm not the communicator person, like I said, but that's the point of it. We're, we're imperfect. We're going through the struggles. We're helping each other out. Um, okay, that, that's the, the value of it. Um, so again, with that being said, we'll thank you on behalf of Next Stop Veterans. And our team here, again, we thank you very much for your time here. And um, that's it for today. Thank you.